I'm Jack Lang. I'm chair of the Raspberry Pi Foundation. The Raspberry Pi Foundation exists to help people learn computer science, and uh, we accidentally turned into the fastest growing computer company in the world. So this is all about it. Who has a Raspberry Pi already? Three people, pretty good. Um, this is that's a Raspberry Pi, there's one here. Pass it around for those who want. It's a full computer on a credit card size chip, credit card size uh, board. That's another view of it. Made in the UK, um, designed in Cambridge, manufactured in Wales. It's a full computer. Um, if you go around it, there's power, lots of input output, plugs into a TV, USB, local area network, and other good things. So you can use it as a complete computer. Why do we do this? Well, where did it all start? I teach at Cambridge University in computer science, and I interview people coming out to read computer science. And we have a real problem. We couldn't fill the courses. We weren't getting enough good candidates coming in. The number of people applying to read computer science had dropped in the last 10 years by a factor of two, 50% of what it used to come. And the kids who came weren't as good as the ones they used to do, they used to get. You may remember in the old days, we, people had things like BBC microcomputers, and that meant kids spent three hours a night in their bedroom play, learning to program. And by the time they got to us, they had some notion about things like BASIC, maybe some assembler code, and they pretty well knew what the computer was and how it could do. These days, kids don't, don't program, they download. And so, if we're lucky, they can just about write a computer program, a, a web page. They can't write computer programs. And that's terribly sad, because if you don't know how to program, you don't know how to use a computer properly, you don't understand a computer, you're a slave to those who do. And we can see disasters happening, like the 100 million pounds the BBC misspent, for example. So computing entry, A-level computing continues to decline. And part of this is because what schools have been teaching has not been computing except for a very few schools. They've been mostly teaching something called ICT, which we call typing. <laughs> <laughs> except it's not as good as typing because you don't actually learn to type. <laughs> you learn to use whatever the current implementation of a word processor is. And that isn't very good, doesn't. And you knew that anyway, because you've been using it since the age of four uh, at home. So we thought maybe if we make a super cheap computer, um, it would help, because it's, learning to compute is like learning to write or use a musical instrument. It's not the hour a week in school that matters, it's the three hours a night in your bedroom that matter. So as I say, kids have stopped programming. Various other people have noticed this effect as well. The computing at the schools group formed um, uh, which is an excellent um, group for teachers and a pressure group for government. And Eric Schmidt, for example, noted that the uh, country was throwing away, who was Google CEO, noted that the country was throwing away its great computer heritage. And, he, and that put pressure on the government. So the, the curriculum is changing, but these things happen slowly. So, in 2008, I wrote a manifesto saying, what's the BBC computer for today? And various others, the stars aligned and people came together. Even Upton, who's in the top left, had been experimenting with low-cost designs. He works as a chip designer for Broadcom, and they were very supportive. David Braben, who's in underneath Even Upton, um, runs Frontier Games and was thinking about, he wasn't getting enough games programmers, and was thinking about doing software to encourage people to learn to program. The, our professor Alan Mycroft and um, Rob Mullins are in the computer lab and they joined in. And Pete Lomas is at the top right, is a real engineer and we all four got together and formed a, a charity to try and encourage people to come and learn computing. We designed a computer and implemented the first version of it went to talk to the BBC about using the BBC name because it was part of that heritage. 
We couldn't use the BBC name because the BBC is now corporate and they can't favor one group over another group. But while we were there, Rory Kathleen Jones, their technology correspondent, took some pictures and put it on their blog. We had 800,000 downloads. That gave us a problem. We promised um, 800,000 people would make a 15 pound computer and the current prototypes cost us 150 pounds. <laughs> So we had to start working quite quickly. We were committed. Cambridge Angels went around some friends and raised a little bit of money in donations and soft loans, which are now all being re repaid. We ran a fairly open project with a blog, and that causes a number of injuries. That caused both people to come and help us, but also causes certain embarrassments every now and then. For example, we thought we we would um, ship. We announced we'd ship in fourth quarter of 2011. People interpret that to mean 17th of November. So after 17th of November, we were getting messages saying, you're late, why are you late? It's all a scam. <laughs> we thought we'd sell about 10,000 units because how many university students are there who are reading computer science and how many of those are going to be? And there are lots of other single board computers that are excellent, like Arduino and so on. So we've bought 10,000 chips, which sat in my garage. We ordered, uh, found a contract manufacturer through a friend of a friend, we'd never met the guy, and ordered 2,000 to be made up into boards. And so we sent off to China, in fact to a flat in Hong Kong as the shipping agent, because that's how you get things there. And uh, we sent 2,000 pounds, well, 100,000 pounds worth of chips and um, uh, some money and hoped and a while later, a, a pallet turned up, a, a large truck turned up at my house with a pallet of 2,000 computers. We took a couple off and they worked and then we were, we were in business. So to say we shipped in 2011, we put some on eBay. These are 15 pound computers, remember. They went for 2,500 pounds. So we knew we had a problem. <laughs> there was some market demand out there. We also incidentally put the software up on the website for people to download. And this is a software for a computer that didn't yet exist. And we had 60,000 downloads. So we realized that six people couldn't do it in the garage. <laughs> so we changed to a licensing model. So we licensed the design to Radio Spares and Premier Farnell, who came on board and were very good as manufacturers and distributors. They bought our remaining stock. And we launched on um, the 29th of February 2012. We took their websites down. These are billion dollar companies, and we crashed their websites. Oops. <laughs> Sales peaked at about 700 a second. We sold 350,000 that day. This was against our original estimate of 10,000. So um, this gave us a whole series of problems. It wasn't a development board anymore. We had to get safety approvals and well, we couldn't ship it as a development board. We had to get all the approvals and so on. We had to learn about volume manufacturing very quickly. And we've spun up two more lines. In fact, we now have six lines in Wales and two in China. We've actually shipped a million and a half units so far. We're shipping 10,000 a day compared to the 10,000 year in the original estimate total. And they're all over the world. This is an example of the power of community. This was put up by a lad called, a 17 year old lad called Ryan. Ryan and uh, it allows people to register their, their pie. And you see we're mostly in the UK, in Europe and in North America. And about a third in the rest of the world. And they're used all over the world for all sorts of things. Because it's very good for the internet of things because it's got um, in graphic, high speed graphics, it's also got lots of input output and you can run a web server on it. So this is what it's meant to be useful. This is a kid's language called Scratch from MIT, which is a drag and drop language very good for learning programming. A lot of people use it as a media center. We ported Xbox media center on it and you internet in TV out. So people use it to do that. We've sold pretty well a million and a half by now and uh, we're basically production limited. 
but it's a real hassle. It's no longer a development system. We have to get lots of approval. C is not China export, it's consumer electronics mark. RIHS is a safety mark, FCC is an emissions mark. We is a waste disposal mark. We have to get licenses for MPEG, HDMI, and all sorts of other graphics and standards. And because of lots of people using it for non-educational uses, that has implications on our charity status, so we had to set up a separate trading company. And we also have to deal with import tariffs all over the world. Brazil, for example, has a 100% import tariff that we have to set up local manufacture to get round. So it's been quite a ride. Lots of people in the community build add-on boards to connect it to things. We, uh, Minecraft, bought in Minecraft, and included a programming language. Who, anyone use Minecraft? Few people. Well, you can run Minecraft on it, but it's My Minecraft Plus. There's a programming language, Python, built into it, so you can build, will, build models programmatically, which is great for moving kids on. Here's an example of people using it in uh, developing countries. This is in Batanga in Upper East Ghana, rural Upper East Ghana, where they don't have internet. So they use this as a web, as a web server, running Wikipedia, running um, Khan Academy Lite, and various other knowledge-based systems, health systems, and so on. And that's, we think, is going to be quite a major use. It's also being used for a similar purpose in, by a different group in Bhutan. All sorts of people have done all sorts of things with this. This guy put it on a weather balloon and took pictures from the edge of space. This guy used it to control his home brewery. Beer and computers seem to go together very well. <laughs> this is using it to track, um, to control a camera, both pan and time-lapse photography. We made our own camera for it. This is another $25 camera. Uh, it runs full 1080p video, high-definition video, for $25. So there's lots and lots of things people use it for. If you have a million and a half. And finally, if you can't control the technology, you're controlled by those who can, as I say. Computer science shouldn't be an optional ex extra, but should be built into the school as a real science. And slowly that's happening with things like curriculum changes, but schools move very slowly because they're governed by tick marks. So after school clubs and lunchtime computer clubs work very well, things like coded dojos. Google's given us a million dollars to give computer pies to schools, but we actually want to give it to the kids because it's owned by the pupils themselves, not by the school. And finally, this is, this is partly going to change the world. MOOCs, massive online open courses are coming. So instead of my lecturing to 100 people, I can be online and lecture to 100,000 people. So you can do the bulk of the information transfer online and then spend the school time doing face-to-face, one-on-one, small group tuition, and that works very well. Okay, thank you. <laughs>